Hello and welcome to another episode of Unstuff America. I am here today with Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams as our guest. I am so psyched that uh, Reverend Angel is joining us today. Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams is an author, activist, and spiritual leader. She freely and fiercely bridges the worlds of social justice and personal practice. And really, I've been a fan for a long time. I'm so psyched to, for my own benefit to have this conversation with Reverend Angel and also to share her wisdom and um, big heart, big vision mm-hmm. with all of you listeners. So welcome to the program, Reverend Angel. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us, uh, just to start us off, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. What does a typical day look like for you? A uh, typical day, uh, with, with as, as long as I can <laughs> rally myself <laughs> to it, is um, I'm, 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 a pretty, I'm pretty oriented around uh, routines. Yes. And, um, as much as I can, especially if I'm when I'm home. And so I get up in the morning and I drink my apple cider vinegar, <laughs> uh, which, which I almost choked myself on a few seconds ago. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I sit down and I think about what it is that I'm up to for the day. I kind of arrange my day and uh, then I start working on the whatever's most important and most pressing for the day. I try to keep my days so that I don't um, have a lot of, and so this is actually unusual in terms of timing, so that I don't actually use up my brain function because <laughs> I worry about it being limited uh-huh. uh, in the morning. So typically I'm doing my own work in the mornings and then mm-hmm. uh, after about 11 or so, then I start having meetings and that kind of thing, getting involved. Uh, I don't look at email first thing in the morning and all of that stuff. Um, and then I go on from there. It's a lot of uh, scheduling, uh, manage in, managing incoming. Um, I'm really interested in social media news, what it means to us. That's a big part of what I look at and pay attention to, and, uh, but also make sure that I get overly absorbed in. Um, usually I have a set of headphones on all throughout the day too. <laughs> so uh-huh. that it, I have like a, my own private office. So that's if I'm on the ground. If I'm off the ground and all bets are off and I'm sort of at the whim of whatever schedule in the place that I'm located. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And what's home life like? Do you live alone? Do you live with other people? Um, yeah. Um, so I currently, which is actually, I'm just in this transition. I've lived in a place, it's, we call it the Center for Transformative Change. I've been here for about almost 11 years now, actually. And we're actually about to move. Uh, so by March, we'll move. And so I've lived with people for the last um, 12, 13 years since I've been in the Bay Area. I'm originally a New Yorker. And so I live with my partner, is, uh, stays the closest to me of everyone else. <laughs> uh, and then we have some folks that are community members. We practice with uh, meditation. We had a great meditation hall and a and, uh, place to practice yoga and all sorts of things right in our backyard. So we're not going to have that anymore. So I'm shifting up my life a little bit. But yeah, it's been a long time of living with basically six, seven people uh, in and out. We spent some time doing Airbnb. I think everybody <laughs> tries it out a little bit. Um, but I spent seven years as a residential teacher here with, living with seven people. And I always say that uh, seven years with seven people, uh, there's like dog years. So I have uh, 49 years of teaching experience because you are living with people day and night. It's not like someone in coming and dropping in on meditation once, you know, once a week or, you know, even five times a week for an hour, an hour and a half. You wake up with people, you deal with their issues, their losses, their griefs. Uh, their, you know, boo-boos uh, when they overeat and get themselves sick, uh, when they come home too drunk, all of the things. And so uh, I did that for seven years and it was a fantastic experience and I'm not going to do it anytime. <laughs> I'm like, I tell people I put my time in, you know, I, uh, it doesn't, I don't, I don't have the age for it, but I put my time in. <laughs> right. Yeah. I hear you. No, that's great. I, I, uh, I, was with a theater company that used to perform in prisons and penitentiaries around the United States. And I lived with them. It was, uh, that was only for six months. And we lived communally. We traveled on a school bus and slept on the school bus in truck stops. And, and that also, uh, that felt like dog years as well. It was, it was six real months, but it felt like Mm -hmm. it was, 
you know, just shy of uh, three and a half or four years com- compressed for the intensity of, of that, yes. of that experience. It was, uh, and it was great work. I mean, really, it was some of the best work that I've ever done. And at the same time, wow, just waking up at two o'clock in the morning in the Adirondacks of New yes. York with no heat because it's a diesel. Um, it was a, it was uh. not diesel. It was a, we couldn't, we couldn't leave the engine running because we would asphyxiate. So like you would shut off the bus. <laughs> and we would just be on the bus in, in a down coat, inside a down sleeping bag and waiting for six o'clock to come so you could get up and drive to another prison. It was totally intense. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. very intense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I hear that. Um, tell me what really inspires you? What are you passionate about? Let, let's, uh, what's, what's, what's that? Uh, you know, I'm passionate about, I'm passionate about truth and I'm, I'm passionate about like what the, the sort of permutations of truth and what truth means in the big picture and what it means in the everyday sense and how um, malleable and mutable truth is and the ways in which we hold on to it, the ways in which it becomes very fixed in our minds and become, become the source of you know, great conflict, as we know, yes. kind of holding on to the idea of what is truth, but also to recognize and to be really in relationship with the profound reality that there are universal truths and that they hold us together and that they bind us together and that we're in this dance between our individual mutable truths, uh, the dis- the distance and difference and the chasm sometimes uh, between our truth and someone else's truth mm-hmm. and trying to negotiate that and that all simultaneously we are held in universal truths. Um, and, and these days, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the concept of what is our whole truth. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, certainly. Yeah, that's, um, that's great. Um, it, it, so just uh, let's, let's go down. I don't want to go all the way down the rabbit hole, but tell me, like, give me an example of, of a universal truth <laughs> that you know to be true, that you feel confident uh, in saying this is something that it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. I mean, plant animal, mineral, human, we're, we live, we are governed by these rules or these are, this is a truth that is true for every, everything. Yeah. Things change. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. Uh, Things change. We are, we are subject to the vagaries of change and time and uh, however it is that we choose to hold time. Ultimately we are subject to it. And it has an impact on um, how and who we are and the way we think of ourselves. And it is constant. And, you know, so change is there and it is constant. And we have uh, a choice. And the only, the only choice that we have in it is whether we are going to meet it and be in relationship with change or if we're going to resist it. Right. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Tell me, what's one thing that, uh, ups- what, what really upsets you? What, what pisses you off? What gets you going? Um, you know, I'm not, a, I don't get pissed off in a, any, you know, sort of like big picture way. It, that's that relationship to change because mm-hmm. it all changes. And so I kind of like this sort of, I amuse myself with the ordinariness of like how strange people are, (laughs) how uh, how awful we can be to each other, um, you know, for no good reason. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's kind of more like kvetching, you know, I'm a a New Yorker, so I spend time (laughs) sort of kvetching about things, but there's not a lot that in a sort of enormous way pisses me off. Of course, I'm, um, I feel deeply pained by the things that happen in the world um, where, uh, you know, great numbers of people are harmed and the ordinary things where individual people are harmed and do harm to one each other, another. So I think, I think that I came to a point at which I realized that uh, ultimately under anger is grief. Mm-hmm. And so I'm more in relationship with the grief mm-hmm. than I am with the anger. And so I tend to the grief. Right. And I think that changes my relationship with sort of the quality of the anger. I'm certainly passionate and fiery and 
uh, you know, I can get my back up about things, a kind of like fierceness. Right. But it feels in real relationship with the grief and with hopefulness mm -hmm. that is on the other end of that fierceness. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I, I will say that um, in my experience, the uh, anger flashes fast and hot, and it is sometimes a motivator or a way to get attention. But mm. often it is, I mean, there's deep sorrow under uh, the under the anger. Um, it's either something is missing or something's there that um, I don't want to say shouldn't be because as you say, you know, change happens, right? And, and things are exactly what they are, whether we like it or not. It's our relationship to what is happening where, where that attachment is where uh, a different form of grief as opposed to the uh, a universal grief of, of the human condition unfolding is a different grief than, than a momentary and I don't mean to minimize it, but the, the momentary loss of or the impact of a, of a dramatic mm -hmm. change that shifts right. us or that we have to meet and it was unexpected, possibly even yeah. unwelcome. And yeah. at the same time, it has, a, it has arisen and demands our attention. And yeah, that's like this, I use those exact words, you know, that we, we're sort of confronting. I think of anger as confronting the, the loss of something unexpected or unwelcome. And, yeah. and the, the heat that comes with that, that sense of uh, just being surprised, right? Yes. Like be, being in a kind of, of you know, of, of moment of like, disconnect of like how could this be happening exactly uh, right and then there's i think that the that's the, the hot flash and then you know if we're lucky we can begin to reconcile like oh yeah that's an expectation i right. thought that should be a <laughs> certain way <laughs> uh we do a little check a little deity check and go yeah last time i checked not the god not the goddesses right. <laughs> and so i'm you know puny human and subject to change Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I know certainly, I mean, there's the macro and the micro and certainly in the work that I do with folks around organizing, simplifying their lives, we're so much, and we were talking before, before we, before the interview began, you know, about your mom in New York and the idea that it's always the story. It's always the stuff behind the stuff. It's seldom the object that is the cause of the, of the, uh, uh, confound or the um, the stuckedness, the, the <laughs> it, it's not the object. It's the narrative that we bring to it. It's the story. It's and that's all running back here, and uh, it's helping people to bring their attention forward and into it and recognize right. This is just a thing, right? The story of where it came from, mm -hmm. how it came to be in your possession, whether it was money or not that brought it into, into being in relationship mm -hmm. with you. All of that is where we get attached and yes. then we get to dismantle and go, right, yes, it was expensive and I've spent the money or it was free and I don't want to spend the money or mm -hmm. it came to me from somebody who's no longer here and I will feel guilty if it goes away or it came to, mm -hmm. some, came to me through somebody and I don't like them anymore. They broke my heart or they hurt my feelings. And now this represents all of that, all of my feelings about that fractured relationship. So, you know, this is, I'm going to hold on to it in spite or, or I can't let it go because it's my last tether to the person. And it's, it's fascinating to me to watch folks mm -hmm. in that journey because I talk all the time about, um, just like Kubler Ross's um, five stages of of death and dying, it's yeah. there's a similar five stages that folks have in relationship to objects and coming to awareness around like right yeah it's it's it either serves me or it doesn't serve me. I don't need to hold on to mm -hmm. it based on narrative. It's really mm -hmm. it's about the math and the practicality, which doesn't mean that then you become a robot. Mm -hmm. But you you're able to recognize the tethers and the the web that you've woven around these objects and you get to thread by you can either cut it or you can thread mm -hmm. by thread disentangle it. It does, I mean, it just depends on how quickly you want to get to the other side, but you're going to have to do one mm -hmm. or the other to get clear around what the your physical environment and what you want to surround yourself with. So 
that that's a great metaphor for our thoughts, you know, and yes. that uh, really the uh, you're, you're like actively working with meditation is very much. Am I am I frozen? You froze. So I I just want to ask you to repeat that because it was I sounded like it was going to be awesome and I I didn't want to lose it. Sure. That our thoughts is this constant process of we um, shift a relationship from our thoughts as being who we are. It's like the story. Right. To is this useful? Is it skillful? Is it unskillful? Right. So it, is this thought skillful? And then do I follow it with a behavior? Or is it an unskillful thought? But the thought is not me, just like the story is not, the, the stuff is not the story. Right. We have the story, so the thoughts arise, but they're not who we are. And so we have whatever sort of story we've embedded and narratives we've embedded inside of stuff and things. And thoughts are stuff and things. And I think that that's probably the big uh, hump that it's difficult for people to get over. Yes. Is the recognition that like thoughts are just our stuff and things and yes. they're generated from a past. They're generated in the same way that you're talking about a narrative. They're inherited. Like, who did I get that thought from? <laughs> right? It's like a shoe. Where did that come from? And like that one has been tucked away for a long time. You know, what I think about in terms of like stuff, when you were, when you were talking about that, I was like, I went right away to like, oh yeah, thoughts, totally stuff and things. When it comes to actual stuff and things, I have this sense of relationship with time of like the eventual meeting, right? Uh -huh. Like that, that is like I, the, the past story is not so much as, which is, which is also a past story, of course. Sure, right? yes, you're right, you're right, of course, yeah. Is embedded in, in the eventual needing is a past story about whether one will have what one needs to get it exactly. again in, right. in life. And so I, it, it was so potent the, when you spoke about that, it, it brought that. I was looking, I'm looking at something, writing. <laughs> like, yeah, is that serving me? <laughs> right. But it <laughs> might know, someday. Or, or am someday. I in, like, it might eventually someday <laughs> right. serve me. Yeah, yeah. and I, it's already here, so it would be a shame to have to replace it in the future exactly. when I will need it, maybe not, who knows, but right. Right, and, 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 and that's the amazing phenomenon of people paying to store their stuff. Oh my God, yes, it's, it's that... <laughs> That causes me deep grief. I mean, amusement when I can be detached, but also deep grief because I watch hundreds and thousands of dollars being spent to, to store things that don't even have the value of the money that they're spending to keep That's them. Right. I mean, the, it, it's, it's, uh, I mean, and for everybody who's listening, and if this applies to you, please, please sit still for literally 10 minutes. You don't, I mean, you don't have to sit forever. Just sit for a few minutes and really consider a, a simple cost benefit analysis of mm. what you are storing, what you are paying to store it, and what it would cost you to replace every single thing in there. And of course, what the story crops up in those moments of like, oh, but there's sentiment in there. That mm. is irreplaceable. You know, I've watched that Visa commercial. It's priceless. So I can't, I can't get that yearbook back. I can't get my mm. childhood clothing back. And of course you can't. And at the same time, if you're not going to wear the childhood clothing, if you're not going to look at the yearbook, if the yearbook matters that much to you, I'm surprised that it's not in your home at your fingertips so you can enjoy it. And if you're just holding on to it because it is, it's a part of your past and you don't want to let it go, I don't, I don't want to be the person, and, and I have no agency in your life, so I don't want to be the person who says, you must let it go. I want to prompt in you the consideration of, how important was that time in your life that this becomes the totem on which you are basing all of the the wins and losses of that time frame and <coughs> and how necessary is it for you to hold this one totem and charge it with the responsibility for keeping that time period alive as opposed to remembering it as you remember it in the organic and unfolding of your life rather than I must, this totem must always remind me of you know, <laughs> my sophomore year in high school. I don't know if that really serves you. And of course, God forbid something happens to this, 
you run the risk, and I talk about this all the time with sentimental attachment, right? Your dad is not the clock, your grandmother is not the teacup. Your, your high school experience is not the yearbook. If you're basing all of your attention on the yearbook being the, you know, the horcrux of your high school time, <laughs> you, you run the risk when something happens to it, when it gets moldy or mildewy or somebody mm. loses it or the, the storage place burns down or something happens. What do you mm. do then? You have no contingency plan. Right. In some ways, it's better to be thoughtful about the contingency plan now rather than then. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm headed to my closet <laughs> right after this call. I'm just going to like go right down. You know, I'm, I've been um, in the process of, I'm in the process right. of move. And yeah. so that's, uh, it's, this is very timely for me. And it's a great thing, especially for my partner to just, you know, say to her like, yeah, you know, those were totally awesome. And I'm sure that the, 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 that experience was totally awesome, but are you ever going to have that experience again? Right. And it's a, a fascinating way of um, relating to our lives, this sense of, and I wonder about that. And it, and it takes me back to this, uh, my passion about the truth, about the ways in which we fabricate and construct a truth that is designed to have us feel a certain way or to avoid feeling a certain mm -hmm. way. Yes. And what's much more interesting is what is it that we're, we're needing and wanting to feel and what is it that we're avoiding feeling? And when we get to truth, and, and that's probably is like that, that sitting with it, right? right? And we get to the truth and it's like, oh yeah, it's not really that thing that I want, right? It's, I want that sense of security. Exactly. How can I find that sense of security in some other way that doesn't, and I love the way you uh, spoke about that, like totemize this thing. Or I would say, uh, you know, tokenize. If we think about it on a sort of social scale, right. we have tokenized people in order to um, abate our fears about difference, about the ways that people are different from us, about what it might mean about who we are. If somebody uses the bathroom that uh, we're not accustomed to seeing them use and, you know, what does that mean for us about gender and how do we think about, you know, it's the same it thing. Is. And, and really um, human, human beings aren't, aren't stuff. And, what a great distinction like to for us to all come into is to this sort of a deeper relationship with our relationships rather than with with stuff and things a relationship with our truth yes. like what's what's really what's really real for me here am i really like upset by muslims or, or right or is something else being threatened about my way of life or you know, how do I explore that and get right. to that rather than holding on to totemizing like a religion, somebody's religion or their way of being or their sexuality or their identity, all of those things. I, I love that. I'm going to run off. Yeah. And, like, awesome. Everybody's going to say, oh, no, <laughs> she said this conversation <laughs> with Andrew. And now everybody is the, in the contemplation on stuff. <laughs> all social issues are a contemplation on stuff. Yes. Uh, definitely our thoughts are, but I'm going to contemplate social issues from the, from the range of that and how we totemize um, yeah. ideas and, and uh, it's so much about the way in which we're, in, we're not in alignment with our own truth. Right. And, and, and our, I mean, that, that, that this is going to, the ultimate change for this experience is that we'll leave. I mean, that this, as we experience this and that mortality is, uh, is the ultimate, I mean, that's, we are shoving everything between us and death in the hopes mm -hmm. that it will stave it off. And as we, as we watch people leave, right, then the only thing that's left are things and that we are building this absurd, from my point of view, barricade between us and death and the grave will find us anyway. But we, if we, if we have enough things between us and our end, we somehow feel protected. And it, again, it's a false sense of security in mm. knowing that the only, uh, we will find security in ourselves, in our relationship with the larger world, in our intimate relationships and in our less intimate relationships. We will find whatever stability it can be gleaned in those exchanges and that community 
But even then, I mean, we hear these stories all the time from folks who outlive everybody that they've known. And the ones that are still vibrant and engaged in the world have new friends, right? I mean, they're mourning the loss. I mean, at, at 95, they're mourning the loss of everybody that they've loved, possibly even their children mm -hmm. if they had children. And yet they're connecting with an 18-year-old and feeling alive in that I'm still here, they're here, we're still doing something. I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily... Um, as physically active as I was, but I'm engaged in the world of today rather than um, just mm -hmm. in my memory and waiting mm -hmm. to join everybody or trying to prevent something that is inevitable. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, these are the things that I think about. And, and, and when I work with folks, uh, it, and try to in, engage I mean, that's one of the reasons why we started this podcast was to have these bigger conversations because I feel like so much sorrow, so much grief in the world, so many of the choices that we make about politics, about community uh, is, is being driven by narrative and not by mm. mindfulness, awareness, being present for what is actually happening. And, right. and as upsetting as it might be to our expectations, it is mm -hmm. actually what is arising. And the best hope of, of change mm -hmm. that, that serves everybody is mm -hmm. to be present for it as it arises instead of, oh, that sucks. I, don't, mm -hmm. I want no part of that. Mm -hmm. And I want things to be the way I want them to be. And I'm just going to not participate until they are that way. And I'm going in the other direction. I'm not meeting it. I'm retreating, but I'm angry as I'm retreating. Right. And it's, uh, it's, it's, um, this polarization is so troubling to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking about um, we have in our uh, sort of like broad community, one of the things we do is we have this contemplation called the five remembrances. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about this one line and, and it says, Everything, every, everything, I, everything and everyone I love will be separated from me. Everything and everyone I love will be separated from me. And, and it's this, these five lines, like we'll, we'll all die. We'll all, you know, eventually come to a place where we'll die and we'll be separated from one another. And we sort of go through these. And when people get to that line, you can hear people's voice soft, mm -hmm. get softer. And to just meet that, but that contemplation, that returning to the truth of that, right? That, that really universal truth, everything I love and everyone will eventually, I will be separated from them. Yes. Death will separate us from them. And so if we have that in mind, I think that we then have a much better chance at enjoying and engaging and being fully alive even though all the difficulties and challenges is not going to be like, oh, and, and so now that I'm contemplating, you know, that I'll be separated <laughs> from my partner, we're never going to have this conversation about why did you leave this in the sink again? Exactly. Uh, you know, but we'll do that with a livelihood and an engagement that doesn't suggest that our moments that are passing are somehow um, meaningless unless they can be captured in a selfie or right. you know like <laughs> a video we won't remember it's like we won't remember who we are right unless we have these tokens of um memorization but but really you know the who we are is so evolving i think that the stuff and the attachment to it actually keeps us really stuck as you spoke about like right you know it's sort of like waiting for it to like come back again and to be that way again yeah it'll be awesome when i have that body i had when i was right. 30 you know if i can just get to that if i can you know, just have that, you know, my memory even, right? right. Like work the way that it was when it was at this other time. And it's like, oh, I can sink into the enjoyment and the engagement of actually not having to hold so many things in my mind or, or whatever it is. I right. think that this sense of being present um, is really just the most critical thing. You know, if I, if someone said like, you know, what do you really talk about ultimately it's all this all these words but when it comes down to it it's it's relationship and presence right and how are we in relationship which has everything to do with how present are we or how how not present are we yeah. and that is present to our truth right yep awesome yeah
So if you could change one thing about the world today, what would it be? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I have this sort of like my, my mind went completely meta, right? And uh -huh. I, I had this moment of snuffing humans off the planet. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, I think the planet's going to be right. That's sort of self self involved in sort of my human form. The planet is going to be fine. It's going to be us that are going to be, um, you know, t tossed about. Right. Uh, you know, the thing that I would change is to, to, to yank out the root of what it is that compels us to see meanness, um, it, in our children, in ourselves, uh, in our society, in our culture, aversion to what is right. To, to I would you just yank the root of of that um, compulsion uh, that I think obscures something that I think is even greater is our natural and basic goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have that that compulsion, not just to have it for ourselves, right? So you can be mean and crotchety on your own, like, you know, go for it. But to seed it in others mm -hmm. is the thing that I'm really honing in on, yes. right? That there's, that there's something in us, right? They, how they say, you know, um, misery loves company. Yes, it does. There's something in us, which, is, which tells me that the seeding of anger, the seed, seeding of rage, the seeding of ways of being in cultures and communities that are about uh, hatred and meanness is uh, is our own misery, yes. right? That 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 is the giveaway. That it is our own misery, and um, that we have some work to do for ourselves. I I just pull that root right out, and you know, uh, I'm I'm not into deet or you know whatever the weed killer. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I'd take no. the weed killer to that one. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. I love that image, and it is true. I think that. Um, and I, I know this for uh, listeners. I know this for people that I work with uh, and teach uh, so often. Uh, the, one of the stories that comes up again is, yeah, but, and then trying to get somebody to co-sign the, the but story. You yeah. know, that, that you, we will, if we don't want to be present for what is actually happening, we will keep looking through our Rolodex of people till we find somebody who will agree and go, oh, of course, that totally sucks. You're completely right in feel. I mean, and it, you are right in feeling how you feel. They're your feelings, but you mm -hmm. don't have to act on them. I mean, you, that is how you feel. I completely acknowledge that. And as you say, there's a pivot point there. Do you want to act on the feeling or do you just want to say, I, this is how I'm feeling. And yeah. it, I, my, my best friends are the ones who will turn to me and say, it, do it totally sucks. And what do we want to do about it as opposed mm -hmm. to let's go kick somebody's butt because this happened, right? That's not, that's never going to be the right answer. Even if that's what comes up in me is like, oh, I have to, I have to even the score. I have to settle this, you know, eye for an eye. Something has to be done here. Yeah. That, that defensiveness in me totally mm. needs to be swapped out for, yeah, this fucking sucks. It makes me crazy. And mm. welcome to this experience. So now sit with the fact that it sucks and yeah. sit with it until you find a way to do something that isn't going to, isn't going to make more misery for you as the mm. antidote to your misery. Yeah. I think about the, um, the vulnerability of the helplessness, right? Yes. Like, I, I can't balance the score of, uh, you know, people being shut out of the the country and cast away from the people that they love. And so, you know, ha turning myself into this uh, sort of ball of rage about, you know, the, about the people. You know, I, I feel grief for the people that kind of can make those kinds of decisions. I, I, I wonder deeply, like, what is going on for you that allows that? But simultaneously, to your to your point, um, I often teach this and 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 really counsel people on this when they say, "Well, what do you do?" And I say, "Whatever you do, make sure you do it out of this your your seat of love. Whatever you do, whatever action you take, make sure it's out of your seat of love. Even if it's something that you're responding to that is in, unjust, that is deeply unjust, make sure that you can be with it long enough that what is come." 
propelling you, what is moving you, what is motivating you, what drives you, is the love that you have for the people that you are standing uh, against their oppression, is the love that you have for that are being treated unjustly. It changes what you actually do. It yes. changes the behavior and it changes the field that we are creating and what we are constructing. We can create a, a of anger, of ignorance, of greed, of envy, of how do we you know, go and kick their butt? Or we can cultivate a sense of like, how is it that we create more just, what is it we have to, what's the conversation we have to have to the people that are on this side to figure that out? And, and that notion of being in your seat of love, it's very uh, challenging, right? Oh, yeah. But I always ask people to say, and, and so what's the other option that you're invested in? And, and then people are sort of stuck with like, yeah, I don't actually want to be a not loving person right. or being, even in the face of injustice. And so... Now we have something to work with. So how is it that I find my seat of love? Which doesn't mean I'm saying like loving things, right? It's not like all woo-woo all the time, right? <laughs> it could be coming my seat of fierce love, but still coming from my seat of love. I always say to people, if you can't come from your seat of love, it's either not the time, not the place, or not the person you need to be engaged with. Right. Go find the time, the place, the person that your action can come from a seat of love and the rest of it, set it behind you. Yeah, that's beautiful and, and succinct and, and, and helpful. And so I think that that's even, I mean, to, to microize it and, and bring it to people's stuff, right? I mean, so if, and I, I never thought of it in that way, but it's, uh, you know, when people are struggling, like I can't, you know, I can't let this go. Great. Set it down. I, what I tell them is <laughs> set it down. We'll go do something else. We'll go do something that has, you know, where there's no, there's no attachment. We'll go. If, if you're challenged in the closet, we'll go deal with papers. If papers are kicking your butt, we'll go into the kitchen. We'll deal with the pantry, right? We'll, we'll go find some low hanging fruit and yeah. re realign ourselves so that then when we come back to it, we can meet it in a different way. You, you can't right. meet it and be successful. And again, I don't want, I, I never want the result of the work to be a new regret that you have to carry mm. around with you. It That's has true. to be clean or you're just, it's just new crap that you're dragging around behind you, right? You got rid of the teacup, but now you have, now you have a sadness that you have right. to carry around with you. I want, it's about liberation and setting yourself free. It's not about just changing the, the, what you're bound with. The, the bond, it, we're, not, we're not exchanging bondages. We're it's trying okay. to set ourselves free. Uh, we have the saying, don't, don't exchange one delusion for another. Uh -huh. Right? And so you can exchange the delusion, oh, I got rid of the stuff, but now I'm sort of bogged down in my, my, I'm in mental contortion about the fact that I lost my thing and my stuff. And I love that moving to the next thing. It's, it's really interesting. I do this um, embodiment work. And in a physical way, oftentimes, in order to navigate something that people are up against, they will not move their feet. And so that, set, that thing that you talked about, like, okay, if the papers are kicking your butt, you know, let's go someplace else. I see that literally in people's physical body. It's like you're standing in this awkward way in response to whatever situation we're meeting. I've got like a great little sun coming in and that window's yeah. move, move around there. <laughs> there. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, there. I'll just put keep my hand there. There you go. Pop the sun out, yeah. Um, so someone will be contorted as a result of, basically it's kind of like pressure being put on them. Yes and they won't move their feet. And so I'll say like, how do you feel? And they'll say, well, I feel like this, or I feel like that. And what can you do about it? Well, you know, I, I can't really move. And I'm like, what about moving your feet? <laughs> what about <laughs> moving your feet so that the person that's pushing on you doesn't have the same amount of pressure? And I see it in people's actual physical bodies. We, it's like we, we don't think of and consider like, 
I don't have to just stay in the hardest place possible. At all. <laughs> I can go to the paper. I can go to this part of the closet. I can go to the 70s clothing right. <laughs> instead of the 80s clothing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and just like start. And there's, and, then, and there's clarity that builds upon itself exactly. um, when we create some space, which is what I love about what you're up to in the world. Because I, I, I feel like we don't often make the connection enough between how we relate to our stuff and how it is that that affects the, the sense of clutter that we have in our lives, in our worlds, in our hearts, and that we can't be spacious right. as a result of holding on to those things. And just being willing to be in a different kind of relationship with the things that we, the literally the physical things that we hold on to, yes. you know, Zen and meditation is sort of the world of like thinking about what we hold on to in our minds. But I am absolutely sure, which is why I was really excited to be able to be here with you, that it's manifested way before we get to the esoteric thing of like what's going on in our mind is so manifested in our stuff and what a great and, and really concrete and satisfying and gratifying way to be able to unclutter our mind by just un starting to unclutter our stuff and unstuff ourselves yeah i mean it's always it's it's it it's such an easy way to meet people and plant the seed of mindfulness beyond i mean but if we start with the stuff first it becomes everybody everybody's got stuff I mean, almost everybody mm. has stuff. So, I mean, even people who, who are on the street in a, with a shopping bag full of stuff, the last thing that they're carrying around with themselves is a bag of stuff. So it's, right. everybody's got stuff. And it's an, it's a, it, as the metaphor and as the spring pad to think like, okay, so let's deal with this. And then that, when we're done with that, then we can go inside, right? And, and, and in fact, by doing mm -hmm. the outside work, the inside work starts to shift anyway. But I don't have to. I don't have to say we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do some interior work. Doesn't that freak you out? Nobody wants yeah. to hear that unless they're on the path looking for it. But if I say, "Hey, you got too much crap on your kitchen counter. Let's take a crack at that." That opens yeah. up the opportunity to start having a conversation about. So, like, what are the choices that you're making every day when you mm. when you set something down and walk away from it, and you tell yourself you're going to get back to it later? What is that really? What are you saying? I mean, <laughs> what makes you think later is going to happen, and what makes you think later is going to happen in a way that it arrives without something to do? That this mm. thing that you don't want to do now is suddenly going to be more fun to do then, when yeah. you'll have less time because there's a new thing that came with that time slot and this thing that you didn't want to do then you just, you've had longer. So now it's compacted. It's like, you know, it's like when you get your wisdom teeth, if you have compacted wisdom teeth, it only gets worse as they grow sideways. It doesn't get easier to get them out. It gets harder. Right. Right. <laughs> it's so funny. I have this conversation so often and I'm just like, you know, uh, and, and we just have too much. Right. And we, we have too much in our day. We have I, I had this conversation with my um, uh, assistant the other day, and she said something about getting it all done. And I was like, no, no, we'll never get it all done. Exactly. We will never get it all done. And if you just start with that and the grief that comes with that, yes. then you can, you can be in a different place. And because then you're in a place of like, okay, so what am I choosing exactly. to get done? Exactly. If I'm never going to get it done and I enter with that, rather than saying like, okay, like how am I going to fit it all in? <laughs> right? I'm like, good luck with that. Yeah. Like I walk out of my room and six new things become, you know, necessary and, and important. And, you know, it all seems like it needs my attention. Right. And I'm just like, nope, I'm never going to get it all done. And, yeah. and then we can live. And I think that goes back to the sense of like living in the presence of truth. Right, that we're living in a world that is, uh, I, I just remember, and I'm sure we're uh, probably around the same age and can remember, you know, when we didn't have this much incoming and yeah. it's not getting, it's not getting any better. No. And so uh, we would all do well to just realize and sort of sit with the, the amazing discomfort of recognizing like, we are just not going to get it all done. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, just like we can't take it with us, we're not going to get it all done. No. And so what is ours to, uh, to set aside and to leave behind and to maybe like 
you know, let it go to someone else that make, can make some use of it. I love thinking about what's, what's useful um, and this, that sense of like, how do we negotiate sentiment inside of useful? Yeah. You know, it's, it, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging thing, but we're not going to, we're not going to be able to keep it all. No, no, we are not. It's, I, I've, I've just loved having this conversation with you. I'm, I'm aware that we're, we need to come to a close. And at the same time, I want to offer you, um, are there any last things that you want to share with uh, our fellow unstuffers before we call this? I mean, and I'll, I mean, I look forward to the next time I can, can have another conversation with you because uh, I feel like there's plenty more to mine here. And at the same time, um, I just want to give you a platform for anything, any last thoughts, words that you'd like to share with our listeners. Uh, I think just particularly because of who I am, I think this piece that we talked about, like, you know, you don't have to get into some big esoteric thing. You know, I'm, I'm known mostly around the fact of being a meditation teacher and teacher practitioner, but it's like, Really, uh, I started uh, much of what I think of now as the depth of my practice at being like, yeah, I'm going to make my bed in the morning and I'm going to be considerate of like how it is that I'm ordering my life. And the next step of that meant that I had to disengage with a lot of things that were creating disorder in my life because my mind was holding on to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's enormous um, and uh, potential in, in terms of what we can have and how we can come into our own truth just by uncluttering our stuff, by unstuffing ourselves. And so I think that what you're doing is like, as, as they would say, if I were Christian or many other religions, I might say you're doing God's work. I don't know what Buddhists say about it. I'm not, I'm not a very good Buddhist, <laughs> but you're doing the doing the work that is, um, you know, that most of us can wrap our heads around. Because as you said, we've all got stuff and, yeah. and we don't have to, um, you know, make that about uh, an assault on who we are as human beings. We can just start working with our stuff. Awesome. So thanks for your work. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great spending this time with you. Um, please, uh, if you've enjoyed uh, our interview, and where can people find out more information about you? Just tell them on the, on web, on the web where they can find yeah, you. Yeah, sure. Angel Kyoto, K-Y-O-D-O, Williams.com. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah. So um, you can obviously find more episodes of Unstuff America here at, uh, at andrewmellon.com, at uh, iTunes, Pod, Podbean, all of the Stitcher, all of the places where podcasts are listened to. If you enjoy this, please uh, be sure to give us a rating and share it with your friends. Uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to Unstuff America, uh, one, mm -hmm. one podcast at a time, one uh, gracious guest at a time one uh, thing at a time. So thanks for joining us for another episode, uh, Reverend Angel. It's been an absolute pleasure and um, we'll see you all here next time. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.